Hi you guys, it's Nikita Lene back with another video. Today I want to talk to you guys about something that I've been experiencing lately um, and kind of get your take on it. Um, and that is the topic of being the only healthcare professional in my family. Um, it's kind of something that I never really thought about until kind of dealing with recent events. So um, I just want to share my experience with you guys and kind of give you guys some insights um, and see if any of you have had a similar situation to kind of what I've dealt with and share that experience with you guys. So without further ado, let's jump in. quick recap of some of the situations that I went through just to give you some background knowledge of what I'm talking about in this video. My grandmother was diagnosed with cancer um, back in the beginning of 2021. Um, her doctor pretty much gave her nine months to live and so we all went back home to go visit her and I talked about that in my video talking about my three trips back home to Alaska so if you missed that check that video out. Um, during our trip home, my grandfather passed very suddenly. He had a massive heart attack um, and um, died that same day. Um, so in the midst of everything that was going on, there was a lot of different medical conversations that took place between my grandfather passing and my grandmother being sick and finding the appropriate care for my grandmother. Towards the end of my grandmother's life, my uncle even was sick and was in the hospital. So once again, that brought me back into the fold of just wanting to be in the loop of things with what's going on with my family and how that affects me as a healthcare worker. So now that you guys are kind of all caught up on the situation, let's talk more about some of the pros and the cons of it. So we'll start with some of the pros. Some of the pros of the situation, the biggest one I would say would be communication. Um, just understanding the healthcare language because it is a whole different language is a huge advantage when you do have a family member that is sick. Um, number one, you are able to just kind of take the information that's given to you and break it down and have a better understanding of what's going on. Um, and um, sometimes it's not even understanding just what you're told, but sometimes reading between the lines of what that healthcare provider is not saying, um, in addition to having background knowledge. Um, so my background as a registered nurse, I worked in med surge initially, and now I work as a critical care nurse. I've been a critical care nurse for going on three years at this point. And so um, I have an understanding after dealing with so many different people and taking care of so many people with different medical conditions, being able to understand when a healthcare professional is trying to say, hey, we're, we're getting towards the end of life, we should start making end of life decisions, um, or you know, just a lot of different nuances that happen in the medical world. The second part of that is being able to take what they've said and the things that they have not said and um, package them in a way where I can explain it to my family with none of them having medical background and expertise at all. I do think it's hard as healthcare professionals that a lot of what the civilian world sees about healthcare comes from these TV shows that are unrealistic. and. Um, so when they are dealing with a sick family member, their expectations are very unrealistic and they expect things to happen like they see them on TV, like when they watch The Resident or when they watched Grey's Anatomy and that's just not realistic. So for me being the healthcare professional in the middle, working as kind of a liaison, I guess you would say, I had to be the one to break that bad news to my family sometimes. I had to explain things to them that they didn't understand. They asked me a lot of questions that they weren't able to ask the doctors because of time constraints and just because of situations. 
Um, and so I found myself really just doing a lot of what I do as a nurse, which is patient teaching. Um, but this time it's my family that I'm doing patient teaching with. So um, it's, it was a great thing that I was able to understand the lingo and explain all of those things to my family. The next part I would say that was a pro is being able to assess changes for myself. As an ICU nurse, we're used to assessing our patients and assessing them often. We see the changes that happen in them. Sometimes it's, you know, by the day, by the hour. Sometimes it's by the minute. There can be changes in mentation or physical status of our patient and we're used to assessing. And the thing about us being nurses is that we are assessing even when nobody else in the room knows that we're assessing things. Even while we're talking to people, we can we can listen to, okay, I hear them wheezing across the room, um, or I can see their work of breathing has increased, and we're always constantly scanning and assessing. And I think for me, it was great because I was able to assess the situation and look at my grandmother and tell something was going Going on and and see the decline in her health for myself and I was able to once again intercede and explain to her providers what I saw and give them my assessments and um, sometimes that went over well they, they understood that I was a healthcare professional and they listened to what I had to say and sometimes they kind of blew me off because they thought that I was like you know, a lot of times when family members Google stuff and look stuff up online and so healthcare professionals may not always take that seriously. The last pro that I have listed here are medications. Um, so my grandmother was on a lot of medications even prior to her diagnosis of cancer because she was dealing with some issues with her kidneys and all sorts of other medical things. As we stepped in and attempted to help her, there's a lot of medications that my family members are like, what is this? I don't know what this is. How do I know she's supposed to be taking this or how often she's supposed to be taking this? And even though on the bottle, sometimes it'll clearly say, you know, take this medication this many times a day. How do we know that she's supposed to still be on this dosage? So there's a lot of questions that came up. Um, at what point we had to call her provider and her provider was able to go down her list and do like a medication reconciliation. And I was able to help with that portion because I understood what the medications were and what they were for, as well as being able to communicate how often she's been taking them. And that really helped um, to kind of eliminate what she no longer needed and help us to get her on a better schedule with her medications. All right, you guys, so now let's talk about the cons. Um, I wanna preface this part of my video by saying that I don't hold any ill will towards anyone, and um, I tried my best not to take some of these things personally because I understood that, you know, when you have a loved one that's sick, your behavior is not always the best. Your reactions are not always the best. You're under emotional duress so and distress. So a lot of the things that happen, I tried my best not to take them personally. And um, I will say that I've seen a lot of the same behaviors at my job working as a critical care nurse. So it made it a little bit harder for me um, initially to try and separate the two of them and to say like why would this person treat me this way because I am their loved one too versus they would treat me like this if we were in the hospital setting um, and there is a thin line you guys between healthcare hero and bad guy and I have recognized this a lot in my job even like after the um pandemic happened or in the midst of it we were considered heroes nurses were put um, on this high pedestal because people saw everything we were doing we were you know doing so much to save lives and we were putting ourselves out there putting ourselves in harm's way to save others lives and when you watched it on TV, on the news, even in these TV shows, they all incorporated that in there. And there was this feeling of camaraderie. And now when you look at the nursing community and what's currently going on, everything from 
the Redonda Vop case and the other two nurses that have now been put on trial and accused for medical errors and medication errors and things like that. Um, and you look at them trying to cut travel nurse pay or cap travel nurse pay. All of these things are kind of like there is a very, very, very thin line between healthcare hero and bad guy. And I really feel like nurses, they put us on this pedestal for them to knock the pedestal from under us. And now we're on our backs and we are fighting and we're fighting just to survive as nurses, just to be able to do our jobs and work as healthcare professionals. It's It's been tough because in this situation with my family, I saw the exact same behaviors and um, things that I've seen in the media and in the news and in real life at my job in my family's behavior. And so that was that was really tough for me to deal with. It took me a while to process that. I feel like it almost stunted my grieving process because I had to grieve. I had to wait to grieve because I was treated like a regular healthcare professional um, and there was a lot of situation that just felt made me feel like I cannot start the grieving process because right now in this moment I have to be a healthcare professional. I have to do patient teaching. I have to explain this. And I'll kind of get into some of those details of that in a minute, but I just wanted to preface that by saying that I saw real life imitated in many different ways, both in my job setting, in the real world, outside of work, and in my personal life. And so it was it was a tough time for me being a nurse. I really went through it and I really had moments where I was like, screw this i'm out i don't want i don't want to be a nurse anymore <laughs> this is too much it's not even worth it i i really felt very frustrated through a lot of these situations because i was getting it at work in the public whenever i log into tiktok log into instagram and from my family and so i felt like i was getting it from every different direction but let's get into some of these cons so I can kind of give you guys the details and you can understand what I'm talking about. So let's start with the fact that people do not like you to tell it like it is. And unfortunately, as healthcare professionals, that's what we have to do. We deliver bad news to people, to family members all the time, to our patients and to their family members. And does it suck? Yes, but it's a part of our job. We can't sugarcoat stuff. We have to say it like it is and give people the opportunity to do with that information what they will. And sometimes in the process of them processing that information, they may verbally abuse us, they take it out on us, and um, it sucks. It sucks to be on the opposite end of that because you really are there to help, you really are there to be a part of the, of the healing process or at least helping that person, if they are passing, helping them die with dignity. But sometimes you just have to tell it like it is and you have to be the person who delivers bad news. And unfortunately, that kind of makes you a part of being the bad guy as well. And people do not like you after you deliver bad news to them. That's all it is. And unfortunately, even though it is my family, when I was the person delivering the bad news, it's almost like my face wasn't on it. It was me coming as a healthcare professional. And so sometimes when I would say things that they didn't like, I was met with a lot of like, a lot, it was like a headbutting kind of situation where they didn't like what I had to say and it did not go over very well. So there was a friction after I would say what I had to say. You can't beat around the bush sometimes, you have to say what needs to be said. And so that was one of the toughest parts is like I'm no stranger to delivering bad news to people and sometimes um, when I was working as a crisis nurse it would be me having to, to deliver bad news multiple times a shift to the same family or sometimes multiple times a shift to different families and um, and it's tough it's so tough to be on the on that end and having to give that bad news to people and having to tell things like it is sometimes on the opposite end of it no matter how we try to soften the blow it still comes across to other people as being cold and being callous when you have to tell it like it is but we can't paint a false narrative we can't paint a picture that you know is all sunshine and roses and give false impressions that a situation is different than it really is 
And so that's why, you know, there's a thin line there because you have to tell it like it is and you have to um, to give details and make things crystal clear, but that can come across as being cold and callous if you don't sugarcoat things the way that that person who's receiving it wants you to. That's so tough when you're sitting there talking to your mother about how ill her mother is and you're calling it like it is and you're telling her the honest to God truth. That was the hardest part for me is having these tough, tough, tough conversations with people that I love and it, I feel like it just put me in a very compromising situation. The next con is nobody wants to have the tough conversations. Nobody. Um, there are so many ridiculous excuses that come up whenever it's time to drag your feet to avoid having tough conversations. And um, it doesn't help. Prolonging these tough conversations does not help at all. And um, you know, there were a couple of times where people were prolonging conversations with my grandmother, but she was smart enough to understand what was going on. And she straight up asked me one time just a straight up question about what's going on with her, what's going to happen to her and things like that. And she asked me, so I sat down and had the conversation with her. Um, I wasn't going to avoid it. I felt like it was the right thing to do to just talk to her and answer her questions. And I also feel like my grandmother asked me for a specific reason because she knew that I knew. I was trying to be very respectful um, by not stepping on toes, having some conversations. But if, but if you ask me, you ask me. And so I did sit down and have a very tough conversation with my grandmother, but I feel like she respected me for it. She respected me for telling her like it is, for being honest with her, for not sugarcoating stuff. Um, because I feel like that's what's fair, you know? People wanna know what's going on with them and what decisions they need to make. And some people are ready to face those decisions and have those conversations, but their family members are not. Because it's a reality check of the fact that you may be losing this person. And so I felt like there was such a push and pull when it came to my family not wanting to have the conversations that needed to be had. And my grandmother was like, let's talk about it and let's just make these dig on decisions, you know? I was in the middle of the push in the pool, the push in the pool, and eventually I was like, look, if she asked me, I'm a teller. It is what it is. I don't think anybody could be more mad at me than they already are, so let's just have this conversation if we're gonna have it. <laughs> Why prolong these conversations? Let's just have it, let's talk about it, let's work through it, because pushing these conversations off further and further was, was not helping, especially, the biggest consideration was the fact that all of us were there in Alaska visiting and we don't live there in Alaska. So eventually we're going to have to leave. So let's have these conversations now. Let's work through this now while my grandmother feels loved and supported and she has all of us here and let's work through it as a family. And I think that that was honestly what was best for her. Um, honestly, um, I don't know that all parties involved were on the same page of that, but that's how I felt. So that's kind of how things went down, which kind of brings me to my next conversation, which is like reality versus WTF, um, that people really become storytellers in order to avoid the hard facts and in order to make things easier for themselves to process. Because dealing with the loss of a loved one is not, um, it's not easy. So it's much easier to create a mental, um, story for yourself to paint the story that everything's okay everything's okay when it's really and truly not um, and as healthcare professionals we're completely used to this we deal with this in the hospital setting all of the time but usually we have evidence to kind of back us up so let's say for an example and when it happens all the time I have patients family members who come and visit and all of a sudden they see one thing that looks like it's better. Like, oh my gosh, their vent settings changed. They went from 50% FiO2 down to 40% FiO2. They're going to make a miraculous turnaround and they're coming home next week. No, not at all. That's not always the case, right? And it's not that we're pessimists. We're just 
realist when it comes to being healthcare professionals. And we have a bigger picture that we look at. We That's why we do our head to toe assessments. That's why we have, you know, our numbers and our stats that we keep up with. But if we were in a hospital setting, I could point to the monitor and say, yes, the FiO2 went down, but look at their uh, O2 saturation. They're still struggling. Look at their heart rate. Look at the blood pressure. Look at this, that, the other thing. And I have those number, those stats to back me up. Versus when I'm in this home setting with my family and they see one thing that's improved and they're like, oh, look, she's getting better um, or he's getting better. And I don't have, you know, I don't have a record of their vital signs. I don't have this. I don't have that. I just have my assessments that I'm trying to explain to them. And they're like, la, 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 la. They don't want to hear it. And so <laughs> that was one of the hardest parts. It's like, do you let people live in this false reality where, they, where they're they just going to keep telling themselves and others that things are getting better when they're really not? Or do you continue to be the bad guy by continually bringing up the facts, the hard facts to, to force people to face reality? And... Um, once again, if I was a nurse in a hospital setting, I could tell you what I need to tell you and you can go out into the real world and make whatever decisions you need to make and do whatever. The false reality you're painting or do I just move on and just grieve over here in the corner and make decisions for myself? And that's kind of the thin line that I was on. Um, I think it was also hard because my whole family was there and you have different people in different phases of grieving in different understandings and so you may you know we sat down and have family meetings and they asked me my opinion on something and I would tell them how I felt about it insert here my medical opinion and one person would be like oh so this means this and one person would have their own false reality of this means this and I'm like that's not at all what I said <laughs> let me break it down to you again here's my medical opinion again um so it's kind of like, it's a once again, a push and a pull, a push and a pull of um, of what's really going on in people's narratives that they paint for themselves. And so that was really, really tough to have to deal with. Once again, there were so many times where I just went off on my own and was just like, um, so my words are just going to be twisted either way, no matter what I say. Let me just go outside and sit on the balcony and breathe in some of this crisp Alaskan air and just take a breather because doesn't really matter what I do. It's not going to be good, you know? So yeah, it just got exhausting at one point. Um, additionally, I will say that there were some times when my, my intelligence was being questioned. Um, there were a lot of times where people would Google something and be like, oh, well, the, Google said this and Google said that. And I read this on WebMD. And I'm not saying that you should do your own research. Like you should get out there and do your own research. But there were times when I was being directly challenged. Like you said this and this and this, but this is what WebMD said. Okay. So me and WebMD said something different. You believe what you want to believe at the end of the day. WebMD is a website. I'm a healthcare professional who's taking care of very, very, very critically ill patients for years. So you can make your own decision, you know, but for people to directly question my intelligence sometimes, and sometimes it was even a rude condescending way sometimes, I really tried to just let that shit slide. It was, it was tough. It was tough. Once again, I felt like I was at work because this is the stuff that you deal with every day at work as a nurse. And so, um... I, sometimes you just got to walk away and let people come to their own conclusions. There were very many times when I literally just had to bite my tongue, literally bite my tongue to stop from even talking anymore because I was really getting exhausted. I felt like I had to defend myself. I felt like I had to advocate for my grandmother or for my grandfather. And it was just too much. I'm like, I can't even mentally grieve, even begin the grieving process because I'm here giving dissertations on medical advice that these are not my patients. Sometimes it was big, sometimes it was small, but it happened every single day. And so um, I would say that I was already, prior to all of this, I was already the black sheep of the family, y'all. <laughs> I recognized this a long time ago 
And to be honest, the, a lot of the friction I felt like came from the fact that as a family, we were just kind of reconciling a lot of family issues prior to this happening. So we were just start, uh, some of my family members, we were just starting to talk again after not talking for years. And so that added an extra little sprinkle of tension to a lot of these conversations. And so I would say um, grieving was hard. I did not even, uh, I wasn't even mentally able to start the grieving process until I left Alaska and got back to Texas. And I would say that was the same for both my grandfather's passing and my grandmother's passing as well. Um, that there was so much tension and so many different moving pieces in Alaska that while I was in Alaska, I was a healthcare administrator making phone calls. I was a nurse. I was um, the black sheep that was shunned or whatever it was at that very moment. But I was not really mentally able to start grieving. Um, I had moments where I cried. Um... But I, I could not mentally start grieving until I got back to Texas in my own space. Um, and so, and I feel like, yes, I'm still grieving, you know, and everybody goes through grieving in their own way. I do want to do a video on grief and kind of talk to you guys about what that's like from a healthcare professional stand um, standpoint of all of the loss that I've seen over the last couple of years, as well as, you know, losing three of my family members within a seven month span like that is a ridiculous amount of grieving to go through three of my close family members my grandfather my grandmother and my uncle all pass within seven months you guys and so when it comes to grief I feel like I've dealt with a lot of it from dealing with my losing a lot of patients um in the healthcare field to losing a lot of family members in a short period of time and so um, the grieving process is not it's definitely not linear and I've said that in another video of mine there's nothing linear about it there are so many ups and downs on the roller coaster of grief and so I do feel like I'm still grieving and I do feel like some days are better than others but I will say that this entire situation kind of left a little bit of a bad taste in my mouth when it comes to me having to advocate for my family members when it comes to being a healthcare professional, um, I learned a lot of valuable lessons in this situation, in these situations, because there are multiple. Um, and um, I've I've had to learn how to bite my tongue and walk away and let people come to their own conclusions and their own decisions, um, whatever reality that they want to live in and whatever decisions that they want to make. Um, I've learned that um, I don't get paid for this. Like, that's the crazy part. At my job, when I deal with all of this crap, I'm at my job getting paid X amount of dollars an hour, depending on my contract, right? And so when family members are mad at me, when I'm advocating for that particular patient with the family, with the doctors, with respiratory therapy, blah, 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 that's my job. That's what I'm there to do. When it comes to my family, I have to learn how to step back and just be a family member. And there are going to be times in the future, I'm sure of it, because I'm still the only healthcare professional in my family, where my family is going to call on me and they're going to ask me my medical opinion. And I'm going to have to learn how to say no. I'm going to have to learn how to just take a step back. Um, because it doesn't, it doesn't serve me. It doesn't serve that person because I'm still not able to properly advocate for that person. When you're getting pushback from from each direction like what's the point what did I really do this for um and I'm not saying my family wasn't grateful there are there were several times where they're like you know we're so grateful to have you I'm so grateful that you were there to help us do this I'm so grateful you were there to help teach us this and to have these conversations that we didn't understand I'm not saying they were not grateful at all they were but there's still once again a very thin line between healthcare hero family healthcare hero and the bad guy and it cost me a lot of grief and it really did leave a bad taste in my mouth um I will not say that I um regret advocating for my grandparents in any capacity um or for my uncle um because I did advocate on his behalf um while he was in the hospital sick um, but I will say that, um, sometimes a black sheep just gotta be the black sheep. I just gotta take a step back and my, my own, um, 
my own business, my own black business, my, my own business, because it just was a very tough situation for me. And I don't really think that anybody really considered that. I don't think anybody really cared about that. Um, except my son. My son definitely saw sometimes where I was very disturbed and very bothered by the way that I was treated and the, like, the things that people said. Once again, sometimes it was directly, sometimes it was big gestures, and sometimes it was like a little, sl little slick comments and and things like that. And my son, he's very in tune. Not just in tune with like body gestures and mannerisms, but he's very in tune with me. And he can always tell when there's something wrong with me, whether I say anything or not. He's he's gonna be the one who, if I go to the bathroom, he's gonna catch me at the bathroom door on the way out and be like, mom, are you okay? And that boy has my back <laughs> every freaking time. Without like without a shadow of a doubt, even on our like in our conversations on the airplane when we left Alaska and when we got when we got back to Texas, there's a lot of things that I thought, you know, got lost in translation or maybe he didn't see it or whatever. And he's the one who brought it up to me like, did you notice when when you said this, this and this, this happened? Or did you notice that blah, blah, blah? He's very observant, you guys. And um, he's 16 years old now. But you would think that I'm having a conversation with someone who's 20 something years old. He's very in tune. He's very in tune with everything that's going on. And so um, I'm proud of that in him because I feel like that's going to help him in the future as well. And there were a couple of times when my son would literally just come and grab my hand and be like, Mom, it's okay. It's okay. Like, don't don't try and argue anymore. He kissed me on my forehead and be like, I love you and different things like that. And so um, once again, I don't regret saying or doing anything that I did, but um, it just made it very tough for me. It made it very tough. And I, I, I'm not going to say what I'm going to do in the future because I really don't know. But I do think that I have to learn how to take my place and how to take a step back sometimes. Because sometimes I go hard as a nurse and I, um, I'm i very passionate about advocating for people who are ill because they need someone who knows what the hell's going on advocating for them. So, um, so yeah, I go hard for them, period. And, um, and yeah, that, that does make it tougher for me as a nurse and as the only healthcare professional in my family. Um, so I don't, I don't know, you guys, that's kind of the conclusion I've come to is learning how to bite my tongue and mind my own business sometimes, but still being the passionate advocate that I am and also accepting whatever repercussions come with that because it kind of is what it is at the end of the day. Um, and so um, that's where I'm at, you guys. That's kind of where I'm at. I also want to reiterate once again, I really do like forgive my family for some of their behaviors because once again, I understand that when you're grieving and you're going through a lot, especially when you are not in the healthcare profession and you don't know what's going on, that the reaction is just, it's a reaction. And so um, some of the stuff that happened, I do believe was on purpose with a particular person, but I'm not going to get into that. But some of the behaviors, I just really had to just brush off and recognize that it's just a reaction. Um, it's just a reaction. And sometimes people just react and they can't really control their emotions in that very moment. So I really had to come back home to Austin and, um, and woosaw and breathe and pray and really just forgive them. Because at the end of the day, humans are going to be humans and sometimes our reactions, we just can't control them in that very moment. I am once again moving on to the next chapter of my life and um, loving and honoring my grandparents and my uncle now um, and their legacies that they've left behind for us and um, and kind of figuring out where to go from here. You know, what does the next chapter look like for me um, and honoring their legacies as well. So um, thanks again for watching you guys. I love all the support. I really appreciate all of your support. And if you are the only healthcare professional in your family, comment down below. I want to hear your stories. I want to hear what you have to say because if you've been through even a fraction of what I've dealt with, you understand the woes of what I'm talking about. And these situations get so sticky so quick. So Comment down below. I want to hear what you guys have to say if you are or you are not the only healthcare professional.
question on your family. Let me know what you think. I want to hear your thoughts and opinions on what I said. And until the next video, I love you guys and I'll see you guys again soon.